Gordy Dawson, together with Frank Kowalski, was the was one of the people that was closest to Sam. Gordy wrote the story of, of about Frida Garcia, and Frank Kowalski wrote the screenplay. But had, had they they all had credit on the film. Gordy Dawson uh, played a part in uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, um, and Gordy Dawson was on the set. For, for a lot of Sam's films, including The Wild Bunch. The chicken head shooting uh, in, in Pat Garrett was, um, I think it, it was his idea, but uh, uh, being an animal lover, it was very difficult for me to be there on the set that day, I can tell you. Um, but uh, there, was a, there was a fascinating thing that happened afterwards. There, there was a lot of uh, controversy with, and I think it was Peter, I don't know if Peter was around at the time, but Pete, the, some animal rights people were, very uh, upset about it because the, um, the basically the chi the chickens were put in the ground and that you know and their heads were blown off and he Sam wrote a letter that he signed um, Colonel Sanders that, uh, that 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 day a lot of children had uh, food to eat but it it didn't compensate I don't think so to me it was very tough to be around. Can I ask you first, Gordy, your, how you came to meet Sam and what your impression was of him when you first had that meeting? Well, I'll start with the second part first. I was terrified, just like everyone else. You know, he was a very intimidating person just to walk in cold to. Uh, and I was at a place in the business where I was a very low stature, being a class four wardrobe man who'd really just been sorting boots into hampers and so forth for this picture to go to Mexico. It was uh, Major Dundee, and um, the key wardrobe man on it had prepared the show and so forth. And so I, um, I was in the basement of Columbia Pictures getting together all of this wardrobe and putting it into hampers to go to Mexico. And um, they took the show to Mexico. And when they uh, started fitting the principals up here, uh, the key wardrobe man would fit them, and then he would give the... Uh, the change to me, uh, if maybe say just Charlton Heston's outfit, and they, we would have to have five because he would be doubled and tripled and so forth, and I would have to do the aging on him, which and these, these were all made brand new clothes, and I'd have to get out the blow torches and the paraffin and the glue and all that kind of stuff down in the basement and and just age these clothes down because in the period of the picture they went through like 23 wardrobe changes and every time they changed it was five new outfits and they all had to be aged exactly alike and so forth. So I spent three months aging principal wardrobe in the basement underneath the soundstage at Columbia uh, and uh, put them all in hampers and shipped them off. And we got a call down uh, from Mexico saying that the director, and I don't even think I knew his name at that point, I was so low down on the food chain there, uh, was very unhappy because what had happened is they went down and they made all of the extras clothes in Mexico and when they went to age those, because they had to go through the same aging process, um, they just lined them all up against the wall, had a standby painter come in and sort of paint brown on them so, as aging. So when he fell out the troops for the first day of shooting, um, the, the cast was in aged clothes that I'd spent hundreds of hours on, literally, standing next to an extra who'd been hit with, with, with a spray gun. And Peckinpah was evidently just furious. Uh, and um, he, he refused to shoot. This couldn't be done, you know. And so what he said was, get me the man who did the aging. The next thing I knew, I was on an airplane going to Mexico, um, into Durango, taken out to meet him, and the production was literally shut down. And, uh, and he, was, he was really intimidating. I mean, I was scared to death. He'd already fired the department head. Um, he'd fired several people already on the picture, and, you know, I was really green and young and just terrified. And somehow, we pulled it together and managed to make it work. But that was the first meeting. You, uh, after that, you, you worked in the same sort of department on Wild Bunch, but you were reluctant to do that, weren't you? Can you tell me a bit about that? Well, sure. I, um, after Major Dundee, I didn't see Sam or know about him, and he was kind of out of the business for a while because of the treatment he got on that picture with Jerry Bressler. 
And uh, I always wanted to be anything but a wardrobe man. I mean, let's face it, you know, sorting gladiator jock straps after the end of a sweaty day is not the greatest job in the world. And I did not want to be a wardrobe man. So I taught myself how to write, and I wanted to become a writer. And finally, after a few years, I sold some scripts, and I was now a writer, and that was it. No more picking rags. Um, and then Phil Feldman called me and said, Sam wanted me to be the key costumer on The Wild Bunch. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't do it anymore. I'm done with that stuff. And he kept calling and kept calling. And then Sam made a personal call, please, you got to do it. And uh, I kept saying no. And wouldn't you know, the money kept going up. And uh, finally, I had a long meeting with Sam. He said, well, please come down. I'll guarantee it'll work into something else. If you want to write, we'll write together. We'll do it in, in anything. But I really need you to do the rags on the Wild Bunch. Well, he, he, he told me that he says, we're really going to go down there. We're going to cut a fat hog. This was going to be the greatest movie ever made. And, you know, he, Sam had a great way to rally people, you know, especially if he always said, there's only 12 of us left in the world and you and I are 10 of them, you know, I mean, kind of that way. Uh, so I finally agreed, you know, to do the, to do the wardrobe on it. And um, I reneged on a couple of writing deals, which I never thought I would do. I mean, get anything to be a writer, you know. And as I said, he promised me that it would lead to other things. And um, I had no reason to believe him, of course. But it was a challenge, you know. I mean, the Wild Bunch wardrobe-wise was an incredible challenge. So um, I agreed to do it, went to work, uh, took 175 hampers full of wardrobe down to Mexico, biggest shipment ever to go. Uh, had everything, just everything. Um, I remember uh, one day on the sound stage uh, where we were preparing, where all the departments laid out their stuff for customs and stuff. I was walking by the prop man's box, and he had his ammo laid out for customs inspection. I told him, I said, that, that's not going to be enough ammo, you know, for this picture. And he was one of these old Warner Brothers guys. He says, oh, bullshit, you know. Believe me, I've been doing westerns for 30 years, kid. You don't know what you're talking about. This is plenty, you know. Come day two, he was out of ammo. <laughs> totally out of ammo, and he was also on the airplane, the first of several prop men. So with my 175 hampers, I managed to stay in front of him all the way, somehow, the only department that didn't get in the barrel. And um, so that, that was very successful as a, as a wardrobe job. You know, it really worked out well, and uh, it was incredible. When, uh, obviously, Sam had a great attention to detail. Oh, incredible. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it just... He had a great attention in everything. And it, the wrinkles behind the legs had to be just right, like a man had lived in those trousers for, for months and months and months. And if a man had done a sewing job on himself, it, it had to be with old thread and, and so forth. I mean, there was no part of any piece of wardrobe or any piece of set or anything, in fact, that uh, he really didn't um, really, and wouldn't pick up, too. I mean, he could pick it up from 80 yards. He would stop everything and say, that Indian over there, you know, he's not right. He's not right. Or I, I can see a piece of his T-shirt or something like that. And so he, he really had an eye. Sam, well, Sam had an eye for everything. And that was just part of it. You uh, watched, obviously, Wild Bunch through from beginning to end. Absolutely. Uh, and you could perhaps tell us a little bit about the way that Sam would discomfort people and then bring them back, you know, how, would, how, oh. would, how did he operate on set? Well, I mean, I think he had a great knack for realizing, I mean, we all have different buttons that can get pushed to get reactions, and he would know when someone operated very well off of fear, and he'd keep that person scared to death. He'd know when someone, uh, he'd withhold an attaboy till just the right time and give that guy the attaboy, and the guy would feel wonderful. Uh, he'd keep people confused. Uh, he'd keep everyone off balance. My own private theory is that Sam as a man was so off balance himself that the only way he could ever feel secure was to keep everyone more off balance than he was, which he was quite successful at for the most part. There's also the feeling that he came alive only really when he was making... Oh, absolutely. I mean, there was nothing sadder than to see Sam without a picture. It was a king without a kingdom. Uh, it was very hard in the beginning of a picture to get him to roll a camera. I mean, the prep would go on and on and on, and then it would be this reason we couldn't start and that reason we couldn't start. And then once you begin shooting, uh, he was definitely in his element. He was the king. He was in charge. Uh, come the end of the picture, you couldn't take the camera away from him. Ask Phil Feldman the last days on, on the Wild Munch. Sam saying, no, I have to get five more inserts of fuses burning under the bridge, you know. He just couldn't take the camera away from him at the end. And when it was gone, he went into this really funk uh, through the editing uh, process. He was really kind of 
down. I mean, think of the Wild Bunch. He knew he had a great picture going. But nevertheless, he was a different guy once the set was gone. Uh, and then when the picture was over altogether, he just, he just, just shriveled up, you know, until the next one came along. He seemed to be a man who needed to, to make, to have enemies around him. Can you talk a little well, about he create yeah he created enemies. I mean, it, it sometimes I think maybe on Pat Garrett and Billy Gid especially, uh, we spent more time doing camp war than we did doing uh, making a picture. I mean, that was more important. You know, how do we get the suits today? You know, <laughs> that that became all consuming with him more than I think to a, to a point of distraction at times. You've got a story about uh, particularly about a costume, haven't you, uh, uh, Stella Martin? Oh Thanks. yeah. Yeah, it was the first day of shooting on the Wild Bunch, and he had the Robert Ryan and his band of derelicts out there, and he was looking up and down, and he said, uh, "There's something wrong. There's something wrong with Struthers' outfit, Dawson." <laughs> you know, and I go, "Whoa, what, what could this be?" You know, he says, "He says just about there. I need something that is a. I want to make him a 1913 Hell's Angel, and I'm ready to shoot, and we're waiting on wardrobe. You know, that old crap that he pulls." So, I ran back to the wardrobe trailer. And I, I really had no idea what to do, and I looked down all the line of costumes, and uh, I had a bunch of nuns' habits, and I just grabbed this crucifix, grabbed a um, pair of needle-nose pliers, and I ripped the Christ off, and I threw it out of the trailer, and I got an old 30 six bullet, and I wrapped it on with baling wire, and I took a blowtorch and sandpaper to the whole thing, uh, and I thought it was great, and I turned around, and there was an entire Mexican village w looking at me. I mean, I just de desecrated a crucifix, and I really thought they were going to take my head off. But anyway, I came back and slipped it around Struthers' neck, and the outfit just popped. And I mean, he knew. I mean, I, he didn't know what I was going to do, and I didn't either. But there was a communication there, and he just knew that it, it was something. And that just popped, popped the outfit, you know, and it just completed the character. And Struthers, of course, did the rest, naturally. Um, after Wild Bunch, uh, the relationship must have changed slightly because he promised you things, hadn't he? Well, he, and, and he came through. I remember we were shooting the Wild Bunch and we were up by the bridge that, that blows and uh, shooting had finished for the day and um, Ben Johnson came over and says, the man wants to see you. And I went over with uh, Sam and Ben and we all just sort of hunkered down on the bank of the river and watched the sun go down. And he says, uh, I have another picture coming up and I want you to be the associate producer on it and I want you to co-write it with me. And I mean, I was floored, just just floored. I mean, I think I, I think I was in tears. In fact, it was it was a thrilling moment because it was toward the end of the Wild Bunch. I knew that certainly I'd performed well in this job, and uh, and he kept he kept that promise. And he and I worked together for several pictures after that. And I went from being the associate producer, which for the first time out for me began with my responsibilities were very small. You know, keep Stella Stevens happy, and 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 communicate for him here and there and as I s stayed with Sam the the responsibility grew and grew until I was actually communicating for him and shooting his second unit and doing a lot of things so those you know. two films um, Wild Wild Bunch and Cable Hope have the twin pol polarities don't they mm -hmm. the violence mm -hmm. and the sentimental side. Ah, absolutely did you did, did he talk at all about this well not really, because Sam always waited for the reviews to come out to f figure out what his picture was about. You know, he never, he says, you know, I'll let Pauline Kale tell me what the picture was about, you know. Uh, but uh, I think of all of his pictures, uh, certainly his greatest accomplishment, I know he thought was Wild Bunch. But on the other hand, I think his favorite picture in his heart was Cable Hoag. Uh, he loved the sentimentality in that. And when we were writing it and doing that, he, he loved the, the underlying sentimentality of that picture and the, and the heart in it, you know. On Cable Hogue, uh, you he asked you to do something which was a little difficult for you to accommodate. Can you tell us about that? Actually, I think that was in Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Uh, both of those incidents were. Oh, were they? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, well, one time we needed, um, he wanted to have some buzzards on the horizon. And, you know, there was no buzzards on the call sheet. Nobody had got buzzards. And besides, where do you get buzzards? And... Uh, and there's who, what department do you turn to? So you turn to your associate producer, right? And you say, I want buzzards right there. I'm ready to shoot. And I said, well, how the hell do you want me to get buzzards? I mean, you know, I can't. He says, use your imagination. What do they eat? You know, and I said, oh, great. So there was this peon walking along, and he had a donkey. And I went up and offered to buy the guy's donkey. I'm not terribly proud of this. And... Um, 
but it was for the picture, right? And so uh, the guy refused to sell his donkey. He'd had it for several years. It was his favorite donkey. And uh, I just kept upping the pesos and upping the pesos till finally he says, well, what do you want with my donkey? And I said, I'm going to gut it. I'm going to take it behind a Jeep. I'm going to drag it over there, and I'm going to draw buzzards down with it. Oh, no, no, no. He couldn't, he couldn't do it. More pesos, more pesos. He said, I'll sell it to you if you let me get out of the area. We bought the donkey. Wrangler came over and gutted it, tied it to the back of a, bureau, uh, of a, a Jeep, dragged it out there, and Sam had lovely buzzards in the background. Let's keep going on that for a second, because that wasn't the only detail you had to uh, help him with, was it? Well, there were a few things, you know. I mean, and Sam, when you were part of Sam's team, you believed, because the one thing he always said is, it's for the picture. And um, the end justifies any means. And when you're on a, a Sam Peckinpah picture, you, you believe that. And the people that didn't believe that really didn't stay around. So he had a group of people around him that would do just about anything to get a shot. And the shot was all important. Um, and so there was a scene in um, opening Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid where um, Billy the Kid is out shooting a bunch of chickens and they're all lined up and they're buried uh, up to their necks and and I was shooting second unit for Sam at the time so he says my job was to go off and uh, he would shoot this way at, at Billy and, and those guys blamming away and then that would cut together with what I shot toward the chickens uh, which is actually blowing their heads off so what you do is you you bury chickens uh, you wrap the wires around their neck and underneath the feathers you hire uh, hide a couple of squibs, and when the special effects man hits hits the button, the head flies off. Um, but the problem is that nobody anticipated was that when you get a bunch of chickens buried uh, in the sand, the weight and everything of the sand on their bodies causes them to go to sleep. So you have a bunch of chickens sitting there ready to be shot that look like this. Doesn't work, right? So how do you rectify that? How you rectify that, oh, uh, God, the karma, is... Uh, you run down the line of chickens with a can of lighter fluid and you squirt lighter fluid in their eyes and they come up like that and they look wide awake and you blow their head off. And that's exactly how that was done. Gordy, I think you were in charge of the, the bus in and out, weren't you, on uh, a couple of these pictures? Oh, yeah. Can you tell us about the bus? The bus. Well, like I said, if you're, you're either on the bus or you're off the bus, you know, and, uh, you know, if you weren't part of the team or if... You didn't do it just right. Uh, you got you got canned. And um, on Cable Hogue, uh, Sam fired 36 people. And uh, naturally, he wasn't the kind of guy that would go up and say, you're fired. That fell to someone else. So I became the uh, hatchet man for uh, Sam on Cable Hogue. And uh, I, had to, I had to strike a deal with him. He was firing so many people. And, and a lot of time without reason, too. Because Sam sometimes would get a little crazed and he would... He was a paranoid kind of guy, too, so he would perceive people that are trying to destroy my picture and so forth, and they weren't really bad guys. They were trying to do their job. Sometimes Sam couldn't communicate it too well, so uh, a lot of times I tried to save the jobs, too. Uh, so I struck a deal with him where I'd say, okay, Sam, you got to give me three times. You can't just walk up and say, this guy's on the bus. you gotta, you got to give him three chances. i got to know three times that you want the guy fired, and on the third time, if you still feel that way, uh, I'll do the job for you, you know? So that worked out pretty good. And, and a lot of people uh, turned around and they didn't, never knew how close they were because I would know it was coming. I could work with it and I could tell him, just stay out of the guy's eyesight. He'll forget about you. Or do your job a little different. Or don't be such a wise ass or whatever. And the guy, the guy would never get the three hits. Uh, other people he'd be so pissed off at that he'd say, I want him gone, that's once, twice, and three times, he's out of here. You know, so I really didn't have a choice. Uh, I remember one guy, a driver, he really didn't like, a um, guy named Glenn. So he said, I want that guy out of here. I want him fired, that's once, twice, and three times. So uh, what we did is, uh, because we didn't want to get in trouble with the Teamsters, and you can just be so cavalier about firing Teamsters, right? So... Uh, we had, a, we had a guy that just did the film run every day. He was never on the set. So he, uh, he would just report to work after the company left the hotel. The film had come into there. He'd take it to the airport, pick up the dailies, bring it back, never to ever 
cross Peck and Paw's path. One day he was driving out with the film and, and Sam had this very distinctive white Porsche. And, um, and I had to run back into the hotel for something. So he tossed me the keys to the Porsche. So I was barreling across the desert coming toward the hotel and here comes the guy out in the station wagon on the film run, right? He sees Sam's white Porsche going to him. He knows he can't be seen by Sam. He just takes off into the desert and puts the station wagon in a ravine. <laughs> you know, and I went by him. I thought, oh, Christ, there goes another one, you know. <laughs> Do you think that Sam had personal demons? And well, what, what were they, well, I, you know, I can only speak for my own demons. Uh, I, sure, I think he was a, he was a possessed man, and I, I think it was, would be much too complex for me to venture a guess. You know, he, he always had a vision. Um, he always had difficulty getting the vision across. He always created enemies. He always created obstacles. Uh, why? I really don't know. Have you got a, a theory about the drinking? Was that a way of coping with pressure, or was it knocking the edge off of problems? Well, I guess with everyone it would be the same. Uh, it, he was a drinking man, you know? Uh, and um, he drank more and more and more in the later years, and it began to affect his work quite a bit, I would imagine. Uh, but he was a drinker, you know? I mean, I can't fault him for that. He and I really tossed a few back, uh, you know? So I certainly... I'm not going to call him black. <laughs> what about, you moved on to, uh, to co-script mm -hmm. Garcia. Right. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, he, he was working on Straw Dogs, and I wasn't on Straw Dogs because he, it was an English thing with the ED plan and all of that. Um, and I was uh, home writing a screenplay. And he called me up, and he said he and uh, Frank Kowalski had had an idea for a great script shoot in Mexico, two characters, and that they weren't having really time to work on it. If he sent me an outline, could I, um, could I give him a screenplay in, in, you know, a couple of weeks? And I got it and uh, wrote the screenplay and sent it back over, and he liked it, and it became uh, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, um, which I think was probably his least realized of all of his pictures. I mean, I think that was one where... Uh, his attention to detail wasn't what it might have been, and he let a lot of stuff get away from him on that one. Did you go down there with him? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. I was the associate producer on that. I think that his friendship with Emilio Fernandez didn't help him in that one because they were both, I mean, they were both one of a kind, he and Emilio Fernandez, and, and Sam really got caught up with Emilio on that picture, uh, who did the, direct the second unit on that. Take that was a fraught picture by all accounts. Oh, it was it was terrible experience. About that, and why why it went so badly astray? Well, I think in the first place it was there was a regime at MGM who got in over their head with Sam Peckinpah. There was an inexperienced producer on it who just really thought God, if he had a Sam Peckinpah picture, that he he would sell his soul to the devil, and he did, uh, <laughs> and he paid for it every day. And that was that was the one where we really had the camp wars. It was more about what they are trying to do to us and how they're trying to ruin our picture. And more time was spent on that than trying to make the picture. And it was a, it was a big picture to make. And it was a disjointed picture to make. Uh, just the whole, the plot of that was disjointed. And, and, I, and Sam had a lot of difficulty. He wasn't well on that picture. He was pretty sick. I think the booze was getting it to him pretty good. He was, uh, you know, mainlining vitamins and everything else on that picture. Um, and there was a lot of problems with the producer. And the producer was forbidding this and forbidding that. Well, I mean, to forbid Sam something, while he still has control of the picture, is just ridiculous. So he would just go out of his way to, uh, you know, to play the game with these people and just put them in the toilet, and he did. And, uh, but in the end, they won, didn't they? I mean, I remember at the finals, his cut of uh, Pat Garrett, uh, as soon as the reel was finished on the projector, they were taking the picture away and recutting it down in the editing room. So he didn't really win any of those wars. I think he enjoyed the battle, but unfortunately he never won. I mean, I, I would say that probably Wild Bunch, Straw Dogs, Cable Hogue, and The Getaway were the four pictures that he really controlled. I, I ride the high country where I wasn't involved, but those are probably the only pictures where he really controlled it all the way to the end, and what you saw was, was what he intended. Certainly they took Major Dundee away from him. That picture was a disaster. 
uh, in its release, and everything else. Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid was. Uh, I wasn't involved in Cross of Iron. I know on Convoy, Convoy he had a lot of problems. Um, so there was only four pictures that were really Sam Peck and Paw pictures from beginning to end, I would uh, say. What was his reaction, do you think, to the, to the cutting of, of favorite films like that? Oh, well, he, he hated it. I mean, they're all a bunch of bastards and, and worse, <laughs> you know. I mean, he just, he was beside himself. But, you know, contractually, he has his cut. And then that's, if you're still on speaking terms with those people, then you can continue to have input. If you're not, then you don't. And he didn't have input. I mean, he was kicked off the lot. So there's not a lot you can do at that point. He hated them. He just hated them. He really hated producers. How do you think he was perceived in the Hollywood community? Um, a maverick, a troublemaker, um, a great picture maker. But is he worth the trouble, like Brando or any of those kind of persona, you know, where are they worth the trouble? You may get something great, you may get a flop, but God, is it going to be worth the trouble? And I mean, to me, I would think it would be worth the trouble because when he was on, man, there was nobody on like Sam. Gordy, if we could talk a little bit about Alfredo Garcia, it's, it is an extremely peculiar film. Yeah, it is. Uh, and uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about that. And I'm thinking of a particular scene where Warren uh, it, it remains shooting a man who's already dead. Mm -hmm. So it says, why, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that was your line, was it? Um, it might have been, you know. It's a, little, it's a little hazy at this point, you know. Because it but, feels so good. Yeah, because it feels so damn Can good. Can you just talk about that and keep the line in and tell us a little bit about that, um, the psychology of that? Well, again, I really can't talk about the psychology of Sam pic Sam's pictures. To be honest, when he sent me those ten pages to write, I was working on something else, and I said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write something that's caricature, pe caricature peck and paw. So I kind of put my tongue in my cheek and wrote everything I thought Sam would love to do and all the great lines that Sam liked. And I put them all in one picture, and he loved it. <laughs> and I don't think I ever even admitted to him that that's what I did. But it was really kind of a, a parody of a peck and paw picture, in a way, to me. And I think, to me, that was my secret fun of that picture. Uh, I mean, the, the violence in that is, is really really unpleasant mm -hmm. and yeah. it, it's clear that he, he was obsessed with violence but in some of the films my interpretation would be that he was going for a poetic mm -hmm. representation of that. right whereas and in, do you have some thoughts about that? well i would think in definitely in wild bunch that's true and a lot of the others that's true i don't think that he was going for the poetry in in uh alfredo garcia i mean he wanted to make a good tough picture about two people that we cared about. And he made a good, tough picture anyway. I don't know that we cared about the two people too much. And I think that's probably the failing of that picture. When you look at Sam <clears throat> in the tradition of, uh, of, of, of other directors of Westerns, mm -hmm. Hawks, Ford, Walsh, and so on, mm -hmm. how, do you think he fits, or was he a maverick at the end of a line? What, what's your feeling about that? Well, I would think, you know, you have Hathaway and Ford, naturally. Uh, I think that's it, as far as I'm concerned. You know, those were the two, the two big Western directors who really understood the West, and though they each brought their own modernization of it and romanticism into it, I don't think Sam did that. I think that he even cut them, and he really was true to the, true to the art form in many ways and true to the characters. I know on getting back to his attention on detail on The Ballad of Cable Hogue, we were going to shoot this build this shack out in the middle of the desert. Well, you know, normally the studio would take and send up a bunch of lumber, they'd build it, then they'd spray it with negrazine or something, and that'd be it. Well, there was an old cat house up in Benton Springs out of Bishop, California, that he remembered from long ago. And he arranged for me to go up there and tear it down and put it on a cattle truck and save every square hand-forged nail and everything so that all the lumber that we used on that set was lumber that was a hundred years old. And all the nails used, though you'd never see it on camera, were square nails uh, that were hand forged 120 years ago. I mean, I don't think Ford or Hathaway ever did that. You know, I mean, that's, that's where he was. That's where his head was. And then, and he really recreated a reality that, that was so true. And I think that's what sucks, that's certainly what sucked me into it, because you were there. 
Do you think he drew on Western characters that he knew in his childhood and put them into the film? I think he probably did. I think he he drew on that. Plus, he was a great student of the West. I know that in getting the wardrobe together on the Wild Bunch and looking at all the old photos of Pancho Villa and 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 all the various soldiers and so forth. I mean, you'd say that guy. Look at that guy. I want I want ten guys just like that in my picture and and just recreate it right down to the buttons. I mean. Nobody does that anymore. Just nobody. Do you have a favorite sort of sand story that uh, sums him up, a personal thing that happened that comes to mind? God, there are so many Sam stories. I don't know that anyone could sum him up because he's so... he's so complex. I think, as I said earlier, the one thing you could predict about Sam is to be unpredictable. I remember one time... Um, shooting Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, we were shooting in Durango. And that's, that's John Wayne's town. I mean, and we were shooting there at the same time John Wayne was shooting a picture. So we were in competition for everything, from the Chapman Crane to hotel space to everything. And uh, John Wayne's crew got to go home for Christmas, and ours didn't. So some of the wives flew down, and Sam decided he'd throw a Christmas morning party. And it was going to be a, a long party. And as it would be perfect for Sam Peckinpah, a light rain was falling during this long party. And uh, everyone brought Sam gifts, and he was a little bit in the bag, and he was opening the gifts and opening the gifts, and, but nothing was really registering. And then someone gave him a gift, and it was a bullwhip, and his eyes lit up. And he started stretching the bullwhip out on the lawn and cracking it, and then he started snapping off the heads of flowers with the bullwhip, and then he had some rabbits in a burrow in the yard, and he started terrorizing the rabbits in the burrows. And then he turned and he looked at the children. And at that point, all the wives grabbed their children. They looked like an Adams cartoon, running away from this mad guy with this bullwhip on his lawn party in the rain on Christmas Day. And it was just so Sam, and it was, so, it was hilarious. If he was back here now, what would you say to him? I miss you. I really, I really miss Sam Peckinpah. There's, there's no doubt about it. How did he change you? Well, first of all, he taught me how to make a picture and how not to make a picture. Um, I accomplished things with him that I never think, thought I could accomplish. You know, I, uh, I mean, when I met Sam, I was a, a boot sorter in a basement. You know, and uh, now I'm not a boot sorter in a basement anymore. Mm-hmm. He was—he was my mentor. He was my friend, my tormentor. Just—just uh, just all of it. I just—I do miss him terribly. <laughs> <laughs>